This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. We're really thrilled to have uh, uh, David Hochschild with us today. Uh, David is a commissioner of the California Energy Commission and someone who both passionately cares about uh, doing something about climate change, but also through his actions on the commission has really uh, uh, walked the walk. Uh, and uh, we are very eager to hear, uh, David, what you have to say for us today. Well, thank you for the generous uh, eulogy. Um, uh, and good to be with you all uh, this afternoon in this uh, distractingly beautiful uh, location. So thanks also to uh, the good people at Scripps and UCSD and all the others who brought us here together. I want to just take your minds away from this beautiful place for one moment to just begin by considering for a minute the combustible rock called coal, which has defined the energy era of really the last 700 years. And just to remember that you know, it was coal that allowed the British Empire to become what it did. It was coal that enabled Germany to, to rise to world power to fight and wage two world wars. Coal was decisive to the outcome of the US Civil War uh, here at home. It was the reason Japan invaded Manchuria at the start of World War II. It's been obviously the driver of our economy for so many years and, and now of India and China. But we are changing energy eras. And I want to talk a little bit today about what's, what's next. But just to begin, let's look at what's actually happened to coal in the United States. So four years ago, four companies provided the majority of coal in the United States. Peabody, Arch, Alpha, and Cloud Peak Energy. And in the four years since then, their, their cumulative market cap has fallen by 98%. These companies are worth 2% of what they were valued at in 2011. Okay, this is the steepest decline in value in the history of the energy industry. Okay, and it's a good thing, and it's gonna give way to uh, what we're gonna talk about next, but just bear that in mind. This doesn't get out there that much. This is where we are, okay? So, I wanna just, uh, brief introduction. I got into energy, actually. I worked for President Mandela in South Africa in 1997, which is two and a half years after the end of apartheid. One of the first things that the ANC government did when they came to power is they provided mail service to uh, the townships. I was working in a township in the Eastern Cape. They never had post offices, and these were all solar powered uh, with, with battery banks, and it became a community gathering spot. And that's where actually I first got excited about the potential of, of solar and of uh, distributed generation and looked into it and learned every time the demand for solar doubles globally, the costs go down by 20% and that uh, you know, we can really take solar from being the smallest source of electricity generation in the world to the largest source in our lifetimes. And that was a vision I got really excited about. Um, I went on to work in San Francisco we actually worked for Willie Brown. Some of you uh, may know him. Funny story about Willie Brown. When he was mayor, he kept his phone number listed in the white pages. Uh, this woman calls him at 3 in the morning to say that her street light was broken. She'd like it fixed, please. And he you know, takes down the information, gets it fixed. Next morning, he sets his alarm for 3 in the morning, calls her back, and says it's fixed. So <laughs> he was a lot of fun to work with. So we had an energy crisis, 2001, rolling blackouts. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, we actually, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. We did a $100 million solar bond initiative to put energy efficiency on public buildings, the convention center, the airport, city hall, and reservoirs, and um, so forth. So uh, for this talk, I just want to ground us in one fact today on where we are with federal subsidies. People often ask, I think, the wrong question about federal energy subsidies, which is, what is the subsidy this year? Wrong question. The right question is, what's the all-in subsidy since subsidies began? And when you really unpack that, there's basically three differences between subsidies for renewable energy and subsidies for fossil. So first of all, we've been subsidizing fossil for much longer. 
uh, it's, fossil subsidies are much more numerous, and they typically um, don't expire. So the oil depletion allowance began in 1926, continues in perpetuity. We had the wind production tax credit, started in 1992, has been on and off. It's ended basically at the, at the uh, end of last year. The solar investment tax credit, started in 2006, ends at the end of next year. So you know, something is wrong with this picture, and in many ways the success that we're having is actually in spite of and not because of federal energy policies. And so it really makes what's happening at the state level that much more uh, important. Um, I want to just also touch on another movement I think we can draw some inspiration from, which is what's happened with marriage equality. This is um, the number of states where gay marriage is legalized. And if you look at this, it's actually happened over a dozen years. Okay, so you go back 12 years ago, gay marriage was legal nowhere. Public opinion was strongly against it. Uh, and now it's legal in all 50 states. And public opinion has tracked with that. So 60% of the country supports it. I actually think there's a lesson here for the climate movement because the way they won this battle was largely about reframing the issue. They made it about love and the government has no place to get in between two people who love each other. And I think when we talk about climate, we actually have to make this about the love of our children, actually, and really lead with that message uh, and not have polar bears would really start there. So. All right, so super exciting thing in California. We're going to 50% renewables, all right? This just got signed uh, just a month ago. Big round of applause for the governor for getting there. Um, and, you know, this is an important milestone. This puts us, you know, basically on a path for fossil fuels to become the alternative energy. Renewables will become mainstream. And I want to give you guys a bit of a clean energy tour in California to show you how this is actually happening already. So we are leading the country, the world, actually, uh, and, and, and relative to other states as well, uh, with renewable deployment, Texas is second uh, because of wind. Um, you, there's a lot of fairy tales about what would happen. Our economy would crash, unemployment would spike, there'd be rolling blackouts. None of that has come to pass. Uh, but here's what has come to pass. By the way, our, doing all this, our electricity bills uh, are 18% less than, than the national average. Um, and by the way, with efficiency as well, important piece of the puzzle, uh, you guys know the story. We started doing efficiency standards in the mid-70s. Our usage was tracking with the rest of the country. We got commercial, industrial, residential savings. We're using half the energy per capita uh, compared to the rest of the country. Um, and refrigerators, uh, as being an example of that, energy use refrigerators up until standards went into effect. All, all the industry resisted. Then the energy use plummeted after the standards. And at the same time, the price of the refrigerator went down and the size of the refrigerator went up, right? In an era where government is being demonized, it's important to remember these success stories. Smart policy can work. Same thing, by the way, with, uh, with televisions. We did the TV standards in 2009, cut the energy use in half for TVs, saving a billion dollars a year for ratepayers and for, uh, for plug-in chargers in 2012. All this stuff helps us need to build less power plants in the first place. Um, so with renewables, okay, Keep in mind, this, this is what's happened the last six years. We have more than doubled. We were at 12% renewables in California in 2008. In December, we hit 25%. Um, this is some of the um, projects where this is coming from. This is the largest thin film solar PV project in the world. This is uh, called Desert Sunlight, 550 megawatts. And e even over the course of construction on this one project, there's all this innovation. So this site was graded, okay? And they figured out actually going forward how not to do that. That saves 15% of the project cost. At the southern end of the solar field, all those solar panels had frames. Halfway through the project, they figured out how to get rid of the frames. The efficiency of these panels at the southern end of the field was not high enough to justify being on a tracker. As the project was going forward, they actually got the efficiency up to that level. So the company going forward is doing only tracking. So all this innovation happening. Uh, this is the world's largest silicon PV project, the Solar Star project in Kern County. This is the world's largest solar thermal tower plant, the Ivanpah project. Raise your hand if you've seen this from the airport. And so uh, second brightest thing visible from the face of the earth after the sun when it's energized. Uh, three 550 foot towers surrounded by 173,000 heliostat mirrors. Um, this is the world's largest solar thermal trough power plant, the SEGS project. This is not new. This is 30 years old and still going strong. And a real testimony, I think, to the durability of renewables. This is the world's largest geothermal power plant uh, up in Lake County, uh, the geysers. Um, almost a gigawatt in size. Actually, this is quite severely damaged by the fires recently. Um, we have also the world's largest iron chromium flow battery uh, out in, in Turlock in Almond Country. Uh, the world's largest wind project in Kern County, the Alta Wind Energy Center. Um, 
And actually, think Kern County, think oil. Well, actually, the second largest taxpayer in Kern County today is this wind project. So really, every technology category of clean energy, we have the largest project in the world. One good thing is happening. You know, there is environmental impact even for renewables, but there's great progress here. I wanted to share this example. This is a project called Vasco, which is about an hour south of uh, Sacramento. They had 432 of these small turbines. Um, very, very high RPM, like 45 RPM, and they were on this lattice structure. So birds were attracted to, to land there. Uh, they repowered the site, which means they took down all 432 of those turbines. They put in its place 34 of the new turbines, which much slower RPM, solid steel column. They cut the avian mortality by 70%, and they tripled the energy production. So we're finding ways to really reduce the environmental uh, footprint, even of, of uh, renewable technologies. We also have the largest biomass um, power plant in the country. That's how, by the way, they load biomass. They take a truck and they back it in and they tilt it up to get the biomass material into the power plant. On new home construction, uh, now 27% of the new homes in Southern California are being built with solar. And what you find, solar is sort of the gateway drug, but then these builders get into uh, building green communities and designing green communities. And there's technologies that you wouldn't even have thought of. They have cap they, they're, you know, a system that actually capture the heat from your used shower water, and they use that to preheat your hot water tank to save 500 bucks a year. So great momentum we're seeing now in new construction as well. Uh, and with regard to solar, we passed an important milestone last year, which is we have more employees in the solar industry in California than people who work for the utilities, right? Huge, huge um, step forward. And companies like Solar City are hiring, you know, on the order of 800 people a month now. First uh, city in the U.S. to mandate solar on new construction uh, was, was uh, Lancaster, California, a very conservative city, Republican mayor who did this. You can't build a building in the city of Lancaster without a minimum one kW uh, solar roof. And by the way, when you do this, you also reduce the uh, likelihood of default. So energy efficient and solar homes um, are 32% less likely to uh, default because customers have more money um, in their pockets to, to pay for the uh, mortgage. So the largest manufacturing plant in the state of California today is electric car factory. Tesla employs over 12,000 people. I worked for five years directly across the street from this facility. They had 5,000 people in their old incarnation as NUMI, a joint venture Toyota and General Motors. And then uh, uh, Tesla came in, bought the site, and they employ over 12,000 people. They're on track to do a $35,000 car that goes 200 miles on a charge. We have about 150,000 electric vehicles and plug-in electrics in California today. We're also seeing electric buses. This is a company we funded as well called Proterra. Uh, they're in 13 cities now. This is being manufactured in the city of industry in California. This bus has a 100-mile range, recharges in 20 minutes. Um, and then with cost reduction, I, I, I like this example. Roger Bannister, you, you all remember, who broke the four-minute mile in 1954. People said, you know, that was a human barrier, couldn't be done. But as soon as he did it, 46 days later, the next record got broken. And in June, we broke uh, four cents a kilowatt hour for, for solar. So that's kind of a <laughs> our, our victory. <laughs> yeah, so I, I actually was in the solar industry for my career before this. And, you know, in 2000, it was 50 cents a kilowatt hour. So the lowest project in the United States today is three and a half cents. We have a, a gigawatt of projects so under four cents, so it's, it's a very bright uh, future. Obviously, as the price comes down, the market uh, goes up. We have companies like Google and Apple and Facebook that have committed to do 100% renewable energy, and you look at what companies like Apple are doing, they're going way upstream. They're actually building huge solar and wind projects in northern China to power the Foxconn factory where, where uh, uh, the iPhones are made and so forth. The latest solar customer, this is the solar roof on, on the White House, President Obama put on last Earth Day. One thing that's happening now is uh, all the all-electric home. Uh, so this is a builder called City Ventures. Um, they're building homes with no gas appliances. So typically in your house today, you have uh, four appliances that use gas, your furnace, your hot water heater, your, um, uh, your stove, and what, what else? I meant. Your dryer, thank you. And so, as you can imagine, so the electric alternatives for all four of those are excellent. As you can imagine, the main holdup is the stove, right? Everybody's used to cooking with the gas. I have a nice gas range, I'm used to that. They now have these incredible electric induction ovens, and what they do to sell these homes, they, they bring in a four-star chef who cooks an amazing meal on this electric <laughs> induction oven, and it works. And they actually have, um, they're saving $4,500 per home, which is the cost to bring the gas service down the street and, and pipe inside your house. 
With the military in California, great momentum as well. Um, we have 30 military bases, and you know, the Navy is actually doing an amazing job. They have a goal to get to 50% renewables by 2020. The Marine Corps has a goal to get to zero fossil fuel uses on their bases by 2025. They'll still use fuels for the missions. But this is happening. They're actually uh, making great progress and deserve a lot of credit. We're building high-speed rail in California, okay? And it was gonna be 100% powered by renewables, and every single station on the high-speed rail network will be a zero-net energy uh, facility. That commitment has been made. With the new economy, I, I take a, you know, Uber as an example. So Uber is a $50 billion company. General Motors is a $50 billion company, right? Uber didn't exist, you know, six years ago, right? So this is an amazing thing, similar with Airbnb. Um, you know, and I think this will happen, it, it's happening here, obviously, in spite of strong incumbents, and that's very similar to, to uh, what's happening in the energy field. But just to keep in mind, you know, how quickly change can happen. I, and I mentioned General Motors, and let's just look for a second. I mean, it took General Motors basically um, a century to get to their current valuation of $50 billion. So Google, or sorry, Tesla started in 2003, and got to you know, more than half of that, uh, 34 billion in 12 years. And you just look ahead, right, at where that's going, and you can kind of see the path that we're on. Um, I wanna close, actually, with a couple success stories I think will uh, provide a little context for the discussion after. I grew up uh, visiting my grandfather in the Adirondack Park. He lived in the Adirondacks in, in upstate New York, biggest state park in the country. And um, what was happening there is that uh, in the 70s, they had built to deal with a local air pollution problem in states like Ohio and elsewhere in the Midwest. They built higher smokestacks, got the pollution in the jet stream, comes down to the acid rain. There's 1,800 lakes in the Adirondacks where I learned to fish and swim. 25% of them died. Researchers were finding you know, loons that, that uh, you know, there was no fish, and, and, and they'd have to fly to other lakes to get fish, and then the chick wouldn't learn and would die. Then George Bush Sr., to his great credit, did uh, the acid rain bill, and what happened is uh, it worked, and actually would cut um, uh, acid rain emissions by almost 70%, and lakes that were dying in the Adirondacks are coming back to life. Okay, and the same thing happened with the ozone hole. 1987, the Montreal Protocol, we came together uh, as a world community and to deal with the problem of chlorofluorocarbons, and we're now on a path to see the ozone hole completely restored by 2050. But the example that I think is most analogous for us now, dealing with the fossil fuel industry and where we're at, is what happened with smoking in America. Because remember, we gave cigarettes for free to every soldier in World War II. Uh, Johnny Carson used to smoke on The Tonight Show. Fred Flintstone smoked. Doctors did ad for cigarettes. President Kennedy smoked. Marilyn Monroe smoked. Sometimes they smoked together. <laughs> okay. Then what happened? Then the truth came out, the science came out, hey, cigarettes cause cancer. Secondhand smoke causes cancer. And the response of the tobacco industry was what? They went from producing one product to two. They made cigarettes and doubt. They spent $100 million on junk science to distort that basic truth. What happened, it had the effect of delaying but not ultimately stopping the science from becoming accepted. And if you look what followed, it's really an inspiration. We basically had half of the country smoking. And once the science got accepted, this cascade of policies unfolded from banning cigarettes on being advertised on TV, the cigarette tax increasing, health warnings, banning on, on, on smoking on airplanes, sales to minors, and so forth. And today, we've gone from almost half the country smoking to we're down to 15%, okay? One of the biggest public health success stories in our country's history. And I just want to leave you with that because with climate change, this is a solvable problem and we can follow the same path as these. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you, David, for a terrific talk. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Mario Molina, but I, I just want to add a comment because it happened here at, at UCSD with Naomi Oresquez, of course, yeah. highlighting yeah. your last example because it's those very same people that funded the delay for smoking that funded the delay for climate change That's with right. all the news, uh, the, the media, and so on. So anyhow, I just, thought, I, just, I just thought it was very pertinent being here. Yep, it's true, it's true, you're absolutely right. In fact, there's a wonderful film on Netflix uh, telling that exact story. If you haven't seen it, uh, uh, I recommend it highly. Yeah. Merchants, merchants of Doubt. Yeah. Uh, thank you, what a wonderful presentation. Uh, I, and uh, I did also want to just comment on the last slide and wondered if there are any lessons learned. 
uh, either by the success in uh, smoking reduction rates or the global failure. And what I mean by that is the fact that while we're much better at managing that in the United States, and we've dramatically reduced the population use of nicotine. If you look at China and other emer uh, uh, countries around the world, you would see just the inverse of that. And yeah. I wondered if there were any lessons learned for this endeavor. Yeah, so I think a lot of this goes to what human qualities do we need to persevere and succeed? And at the end of the day, I think the number one quality is actually relentlessness. Okay, just staying at it and being, you know, really living from your conviction because, yeah, you're right. Things have gotten actually worse around the rest of the world with smoking. I think those fights are also going to win too, right? It's, and, and, you know, our opponents are also relentless, but um, we're on the right side of history. And at the end of the day, we have public opinion on our side. So I think just staying with it is the number one lesson. And then, you know, just on messaging, um, really talking about human health at the end of the day, it's very difficult to argue against that. Um, yep. There's also the latent, latency period, too, which for lung cancer is decades, as is for carbon dioxide, which is a factor. Yeah. We have time for just one more quick question. I feel a little funny saying this because I'm sitting by Mario Molina, but Mario will remember that in the early days of the of the ozone stratospheric ozone depletion, the industry opposed the uh, the science vehemently, and it was only when their their chemical engineers were able to remember you were have to, having to clean things with lemon juice and things, all this propaganda. Then when they came up with the with the alternate compounds, which of course are the ones we're trying to stop using now, uh, the the whole controversy went away. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Thank you so much. Yeah.